Welcome everyone to tonight's lecture, uh, part of SciArc's lecture series in the spring 2021. Um, tonight we have Cruz Garcia and Natalie Frankowski joining us. They founded their office, Way Architecture Think Tank in 2008, and they teach at Virginia Tech, and uh, that's where they are right now. And um, they also teach at University of Illinois, and, um, and uh, before that, they did several fellowships at Taliesin University of Nebraska and Carnegie Mellon. Um, their, their work constitutes a project much more than an office or a practice by design. They cross, they cross genres and modes of communication in everything they do, but always everything flows from position pieces or manifestos. The WAI in their name stands, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but stands, I think, for what about it, uh, which might mean why should I care, uh, or why do you care, or so what, um, a way of communicating their critical approach to everything they do. They present as contentious, indignant maybe, although they shroud this within romanticism and otherworldly descriptions of landscapes and jungles surrealist scenes and pure, sometimes monumental forms littered across oppositional backgrounds. Most importantly, they become their own entourage in the scenes like traveling bards or speakers. The overall effect is one may be closer to poetry or happenings from the early seventies than to architectural rhetoric, although it sometimes um, draws us back to the early writings of Rem Kohlhaas and certainly Super Studio from that time. Their words against colonial and racist architectural culture are woven into their work, but they do not explain it. Their use of platonic forms almost exclusively, although they speak about the low res as a larger aesthetic category, is not explained by their social and political agenda, which is interesting. There's a gap. I think that today, when there is growing interest in upending the politics of architecture and undoing its systemic ex exclusions and exploitations, uh, this kind of gap will be crucial to sustain the discussion. Developing a new generation of practices from this time, practices that endure not only in the words they say, but in the objects they produce, will require gaps to keep the momentum. Cruz and Natalie's pure platonic shapes with their rendition in black veined marble, stone, or chain link appear on stages and in landscapes as a kind of misdirection or gap. The purism might actually seem antithetical to their target as they seem to call out to Le Corbusier's primitives playing under the sun, or maybe to an act of cultural appropriation where pyramid shapes might belong to black labor, as Charles Davis II mentioned yesterday at SciArc in his Black Lives Matter Week of Action talk. Or maybe the authors are quoting minimalism, but without the orthodoxy of Michael Fried's objecthood, rather in full theatrical rendition. It's just left unexplained. George Kubler, in his book, The Shape of Time, talks about what he calls the typology of artists' lives, which also refers to architects' lives. It's pretty riveting, if a little dated. He lays out five kinds of careers. One, precursors. Two, obsessives. Three, evangelists. Four, ruminatives and five rebels. Precursors are those who quietly lay new foundations within an old preserve. The precursor can have no imitators and their work begins at the ground level. We often don't know how unique they are until history is mapped out later. The obsessives live inside their intense, complete imaginary reality and work in a bubble unperturbed by outside events. Evangelists are, in contrast, on a mission to improve the visible world by the imposition of their own sensibility. Ruminatives look at precedent and build on precedent, adding previously unknown elements to a formal terrain, like finding new features on a map. Finally, rebels, unlike precursors, shape their lives on the fringes of the society they despise, forming a new civil condition. Kubler writes that they appear in crowds because the, the way of the rebel is easily imitated. No creator is just one of these. It is like the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual on Psychology, where a patient's psychological profile consists of a dominant condition with a set of features from other conditions attached to it. So if I can lay them on a couch, on the, on the couch for a second, I'd say the Cruz and Natalie are probably on the spectrum of rebel with ruminative features. And I'd love to hear what you guys think about that, maybe later. 
Uh, many successful architects of the 20th century made their mark as evangelists in, the, in a mode of salesmanship and grand vision. Maybe this century, or at least the next decade, will be more about rebellion and the imaginary, something we know architecture often returns to for a time. In the meantime, architecture will keep landing on the earth, and we as architects need to find ways to connect the imaginary to the concrete, or our role in society will quickly be reduced to commentary. With that, I'd like to invite Cruz and Natalie to the lectern, so to say. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. This, uh, I have to say, is um, I think it's a beautiful introduction, perhaps one of the most beautiful introductions we ever had. Um, and uh, I had to also confess, you know, it's the, it's the first time we meet online, and it's a, I mean, it's a, it's nice to hear uh, your analysis of um, of our practice. We are happy to be here virtually, even if it's not uh, in person. And and just looking at the events that are happening in the in Sayark this week, and the fact that we are in Black History Month, and uh, and that we're in 2021 after a really nefastous year. It, it makes us wonder if there's a there's space for that rebellion that that Tom was mentioning, and if things are changing, um, you know, if, if yeah, academic institutions are changing, and if there's a new opening up to to a different type of critical discourse that has been different than the ones that we have seen at least in architectural environments before, um, and and you know, in in that tune, we we would like to start to talk about. The first part, so the, the talk is divided in four parts. The first one is about clinical narrative. And we have a, a short quote by Peter Slaughter that The fully developed ability to say no is also the only valid background for yes. And only through both does real freedom begin to take form. And in this capacity of that definition of consent, if we want to participate or not of, of certain discussions, we of course want to identify with, uh, with that spirit of change, right? Without being uh, sort of reduced to a caricature of what means to be uh, that image of the futile attempt of, of, uh, of a struggling uh, sort of a, a marginal group uh, in architecture. And, and in this hope that things are changing, uh, sometimes I, I, I clash against reality, right? So I was listening to some of the lectures that, uh, of Sayark recently and then I, 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 I put myself to, the, to some sort of perpetual cringe uh, in, the, in the last few days as I listened to Graham Harman and Sylvia Lavin as this, what I find kind of uh, tone deaf type of question, right? In the era of Black Lives Matter to ask, do all objects matter equally is kind of weird. Uh, and the fact that Graham Harman spent uh, some time of the lecture, the Kind of defending why he was positioning with a Nazi philosopher, while Sylvia Lavin was standing in front of a house designed by a Nazi, it is kind of strange, right? That in the in this really historical time, we're spending time talking about a house by Peter Eisenman and showing really powerful moments in our history and kind of trying to explain what is art for them or not. So sometimes I feel like I live in a different reality than most of architecture, right? And that's something that has to do with the institutions and has to do with the programs and with the ideas that we're exploring, right? So I don't know if, I mean, there were 700 views in this, but if you watch it, it is pretty cringy. And to think that this was not done 30 years ago and that is actually happening in October of last year is kind of alarming, right? So we can be talking about do all objects matter equally while well, people are really dying in the streets because of Black Lives Matter, right? Because of uh, the, the, that sort of struggle to dignify life or that denial that architecture has been really uh, kind of explicit in denying, uh, understanding what is our condition today, right? Like what are the forms that are manifesting this uh, sort of necropolitical systems and uh, and, and what type of discourses do we need in order to be able to articulate this, to make sense, right? Uh, about what we do and, and, and the practices of thinking and designing in trying to imagine new worlds, right? What, what vehicles do we have to understand the images that are unfolding before our own very eyes, right? Uh, the fact that uh, when we see this, can we understand what are we seeing with, with, 
with the with our architectural sort of uh, preparation, right? With with the with the uh, sort of capacities that we try to have as designers, right? With all this uh, guy wearing the shoe shame and wearing all these uh, sort of indigenous clothes, or a guy standing with a Confederate flag in front of the portrait of uh, of Charles Summer that got beat up uh, when he was trying to sort of uh, uh, challenge. Um, uh, slavery uh, in in uh, in certain states, right? In the in the you know this is a scene of of the the canning of Charles Sommer. So how how do we understand these images? What apparatus do we have to understand this, right? And understand that this is not new, right? That these sort of uh, systems that are kind of asphyxiating us are not something particular of the last four years or the last year, but it's something that is really intrinsically embedded in political systems in ideological systems, in pedagogical systems all around the world, right? Like these are, in one side we have uh, Trump and Bolsonaro and the other uh, Herr Wilders and Marine Le Pen and, and a lot of the right-wing populists in Europe. Uh, understanding what is the relationship of architecture to this, right? That is really important for us uh, as, as I remote back to that idea of the, do all objects matter equally? You know, the, the question would be like, do I have to listen to these people all the time? Do, do I have to be bombarded by all these architects that in, in, in search of that sort of uh, possibility of doing more and more projects and, and uh, hand in hand with neoliberalism as uh, the, the manifesto of B.R. Kingles of Yes is More acclaims, will work with some of the most despicable people in the world, right? In the case of, uh, of Jair Bolsonaro here with a bunch of quotes um, racist quotes against indigenous people in Brazil, right? And understanding what is the relationship of this in architecture in a really straightforward way, right? Understanding what what media do we have that is is there the possibility of being critical today to media, right? When when uh, our mainstream platforms publish things like this, you know, from the people that brought us shuttle slavery and uh, global uh, uh, sort of uh, colonialism somebody trying to design a master planet to redesign earth, right? Like uh, understanding what, where, where do we draw the line and where do we stand in these new icons of colonialism, right? In the fact here, Elon Musk, when he was a uh, question, uh, if the, what was not in the best interest was organizing a coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia to which he replied, he will coup whoever we want, deal with it, right? Uh, so to give you a bit of background and why are we talking about this, today is that we finished school in 2008 in a, in a, in a year kind of similar to 2020, a, a year of crisis. Uh, uh, two weeks after I arrived to Europe, uh, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, uh, and that set the world of architecture, but the world in general, in some sort of a turmoil, uh, economically, politically. There was a rise of populism. Uh, for the first 12 years of our practice, we have lived in many different places because of this somehow. Uh, we live in Belgium, where we met and we were where we founded uh, our studio. Uh, we live in the Netherlands, in France. Spent seven years in China, and we've been. Uh, in China was a really important space, uh, not only uh, because it, it was a, a culture where we can learn a lot from that we are not really accustomed to, or that our sort of um, basic education doesn't provide tools to understand. But also because we got to experience modernity. Right, like that, that idea of modernism, of that radical change, of that idea of progress and development that is so questionable, we got to leave it there, right? We just arrived after the Olympics when the many cities in China were going through a drastic change. And, and we went from living in a city of 20 million people, uh, waking up the next day in the rolling hills of, of Wisconsin, in the former home of Frank Lloyd Wright, where we became in 2016, um, visiting teaching fellows. Uh, and what was striking and shocking about this was not only these landscapes and this sort of desolation, right? I, I was not used to live in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by coyotes and nature in this way, right? For me, nature was very unnatural. Um, uh, it was also having to deal with the legacy of an imaginary of American architecture, but also when I'm an imaginary of the idea of architecture in a conventional way, of that sort of singular male genius that is gonna transform the world, right? Uh, inhabiting these spaces that wouldn't have allowed people like us 
to be there, right? Like when you see this picture of the of the you know that all white men sitting there in the table with many young white men around him designing the future of the world is really striking, right? To, to the things that we stand for and the things that we're looking for in architecture, right? So once we were there, we also not only working with our own project, but in a way engaging with this legacy, right? And, and we did that through many different projects and many different interactions with different people and, uh, and um, many different approaches of our students that were trying also to question the legacy and the history of such a place, right? In a, in a really critical time. Uh, uh, this is a, a picture of a documentary and I always put it, BBC, this is, the, this is a documentary that is so problematic in so many ways, but just the title really captures that, those ideas that I'm trying to communicate right now, right? Frank Lloyd Wright, the man who built America. So many things wrong with that statement, right? Uh, also understanding that even these institutions that are so precious in the imaginary of, uh, of, most, uh, of more, a lot of people, they're also threatened by the same neoliberal forces that are threatening education everywhere else, right? And understanding, you know, at, at this very same moment, uh, what is the relationship not only to that history, but to uh, other histories that are perhaps more pertinent and more contemporary, right? For us, when we finish again in, in 2008, when we finished school and we started our professional life, um, it was the 40th year anniversary of, of uh, 1968, right? With the revolts of civil rights movement, Stonewall, the, the understanding also how that is not something that happened 40 years ago, 50 years ago, but that is even more urgent today, right? Understanding that uh, on the, uh, the questions if the pavement is under the, uh, the, the beach is under the pavement that was asked in Paris in 68 is still quite similar to what the Gilles Noir is asking today with a bunch of sub-Saharan um, uh, workers uh, are protesting for a dignified right to, uh, to, to life, right? And to work. In this case, um, many of them working in the architectural industry uh, understanding those images, how strikingly similar they are to the things that we are living today as we speak, right? Uh, it, it is the, like that saying, like, I cannot believe I'm still protesting for this. Um, understanding how, you know, this is Baltimore in 68 and Baltimore in 2020, right? There's almost nothing has changed. And we need to somehow be able to recognize in a way the progress that has been made, but also how little really has the, 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 the index shifted, right? How, how very little margin of error we have when we don't belong to the status quo, right? Um, understanding also where our, where our alliances lie, who are the people that may represent us, where we, uh, we may find ideological discourses that align with what we are pursuing in the future. Understanding that we are really lucky, I'm really lucky to be behind this screen here today and not behind a bulletproof screen in a lecture hall, as many of, of our comrades in history had to be, like in the case of Angela Davis. Understanding where are our icons, where are our struggles, and what are the ideas that we are still trying to fight against, right? That even when systems like apartheid finish, we are still embedded in the legacy of them. Uh, understanding that many of the revolutionaries, as a, you know, and, and, and I love the idea of the revolutionary, um, they're not with us anymore, right? Because the system doesn't want them there. So the, the, the true revolutionaries oftentimes don't, I mean, none of these ones passed, uh, made it past 30s, right? Uh, Fred Hampton died at 21, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Patrice Lumumba, all of them died in their 30s, right? Um, um, understanding also what, what does that mean for people like us that are thinking about the future, when the future may not even include us, right? What are the futures that we are thinking about? How can we start questioning the system, right? Uh, and in the case of Patrice Lumumba that, that I just showed, uh, um, understanding really important histories and how they're often forgotten. In the case here, when we talk about the Congo uh, and, and being in an architecture school, when we study modernism and we study all the avant-garde movements in Europe, uh, oftentimes forgetting how these economies of knowledge, economies of 
uh, material capital uh, were fueled, right? In this case, Congo really being at the center and understanding uh, what is our place in this, right? What happens when the history of El Congo is not enough to explain what is happening in the world, where, where the extraction is not only taking place in the colonies or in Africa, but it's moved beyond, right? Like the, in the rare earth mineral mines in, in, uh, in Inner Mongolia, in China, or even understanding what is the relationship to, to our own backgrounds. In this case, and, and we all know this painting by Turner, right, with the, with the slaves being thrown down the ship. And what is something really interesting for me is that, that I discovered through a book of Marta Ponte, is that not only is this picture of a masterpiece, right, of, uh, of, um, of romantic painting depicting uh, the, same, the very same ideas that we are kind of struggling against, um, it was a painting that was sold, that was owned by a Boston couple that was sold to the museum. And this couple bought a, a sugar plantation in Puerto Rico, right? So even the economies that fuel the art, uh, that it's creating the allegories and the metaphors that allow us to think about our struggle are being fueled by the very same economies that are keeping us oppressed, uh, understanding uh, as Achille Benbe says in the provisional notes of the, uh, on the post-colony, that the post-colony, in his case, is made up of a series of corporate institutions and a political machinery in which they are in place constitute a distinctive regime of violence characterized by political improvisation, a tendency to excess and a lack of proportion, as well as by a distinctive way in which identities are multiplied, transformed, and put into circulation. Right? What is interesting about this definition by Achille Bembe is not only that the post-colony is a condition about something that is happening because the colony is no more, but what we like to propose and why the title of the, of the presentation is a different type of post-colony. A post-colony that is based out of a, an imaginary, an imaginary of what happens when the systems of cruelty of exploitation, of brutalism, not in the architectural sense, but in the, in the sense that Achille Bembe uses it, in the sense of extreme brutality, um, are not only particular to the colonies, but are somehow generalized all around the world, right? And, and for, for, for me, I take as a starting point, I come from the oldest colony in the world. Puerto Rico has never been... Um, uh, and a sovereign country since, since it was invaded in November 19, in 1493. So it was uh, 400 years a colony of Spain. It's, it has been 123 years uh, or 22 years a colony of the United States. Understanding how, what, what's the relationship? What do we have to offer in the sense of an imaginary, right? When we see how many people die in, the, in Hurricane Maria, people that were not even count, counted, people that were sometimes unnamed. It was like, uh, they just disappear, like in, uh, in uh, Avengers uh, Endgame, like when they snap and it's gone, right? Uh, uh, and understanding how that, you know, first happening in a colony, it hits you also in the metropolis, right? With the thousands and millions of people that have died around the world in places like New York, right? With where we can see in this picture in the, in, in the Amazon in one, in one case, right? Of all these, mass grave of, of bodies, right? Uh, oftentimes without name. And I'm seeing this installation uh, organized by Rafael Acevedo in front of the Capitol building in Puerto Rico, right? With the 4,600 people that died in Hurricane Maria. Uh, understanding also what imaginaries we may get in order to imagine some sort of discourses that are, that are trying to address what is happening here. But Bonnie in our, in our uh, protest that saw the ousting of our the first governor in the history of Puerto Rico, right? Like the, the, it was the first time that we managed to kick out somebody out of power. Um, but Bonnie was wearing already uh, a face shield and a mask six months before COVID was even discovered, right? Uh, what apparatus do we have to understand this and, and sort of use it to read what is happening around us, right? What was about the poem of Raquel Salas Rivera a uh, really important contemporary poet in Puerto Rico that, that describes the manifesto of necropolitics, right? 
uh, in one side with the 4,600 people that die in the, in the hurricane, and then this beautiful and powerful prose that says, hey, gringo, if you love death so much, why don't you marry it, right? Understanding who are the leaders of these revolutions. Right? This is a, a picture of, of some of the, the, our most important revolutionaries in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is the spokesperson of the feminist collective in construction with a t-shirt that reads anti-patriarchal, feminist, lesbian, trans, Caribbean, Latin American, right? Understanding what's the role of this, uh, of these new visions, right? Or not new visions, but visions that are finally acquiring the protagonism they always deserve, right? Seeing Ricky Martin waving the rainbow flag on one side or Black, uh, black John and Educated, a collective of high schoolers leading all the protests in Pittsburgh, right? That we got to witness. Understanding also the relationship of architecture to these systems of oppression is really fundamental if we want to make any difference, right? Not only inside the United States, these are pictures in Puerto Rico, in US, in Chile, right? Uh, understanding what is the legacy of the colonial city in all of this, right? Uh, in the systems, not only in the systems of oppression that architectural, architecture often forms through, through so-called public spaces and buildings, uh, but also the institutions or what uh, Michel Foucault called the apparatus, like the dispositif um, of, of the police, the army, but also of the university, right? Of the, of the architecture school, right? Understanding what is the relationship of architecture to this in a literal way, when sometimes we are made to choose between meaning and value, right? What matters more to you or what is more valuable to you, if a building or black life, right? Understanding the role of propaganda and double think, to use a quote by, uh, by uh, a concept by George Orwell. When we read about architects designing correctional centers and the facilitate the humane treatment and rehabilitation of inmates while ensuring the safety and satisfaction of each staff member, right? In a country that uh, incarcerates black and brown people at exponential uh, uh, proportions, right? Um, understanding what is the legacy of, of, of this, you know, the idea of the nation state, uh, the idea of the border, the idea of architecture as a device that encloses and that gives you an identity, right? In exclusion of other ways of existing in the world. Understanding also the colonial footprint of this, right? Uh, and, and something that we've been working recently is trying to think beyond sustainability, right? What is the colonial footprint of everything we do? that is tied up hundreds of years and that is tied up to a global economy of extraction and, and exploitation. Understanding who is at the center of these battles, who has been there really understanding and, and being custodians of the environment, custodians of the land, right? Protecting this not only for their future, but for everybody's future, right? Uh, understanding also what are the truly democratic forms of architecture? not architectures where there's consensus through positives or some sort of meeting with the community, but when the people really come together to bring this, the, the, the signs, the architectural signs of oppression and exclusion and white supremacy all around the world, right? This is a, my favorite form of architecture is seeing people bringing all these racist monuments down. Part two, Loud Readers, 1920-2020. The only purpose of education is to make new worlds collectively. This requires the practice of curiosity as a daily habit and the exercise of dignified and purposeful rebelliousness. Other worlds are possible. We usually ask, can you see the difference between the left and the right picture? Somebody will say, yes, you know, in the left one is only men, in the right one there's some women, right? Uh, understanding the legacy of the Bauhaus, right? The legacy of the modernist pedagogy of design that we are all sort of embedded in, right? Understanding that the people that did this didn't thought that women could even think in three dimensions, right? Understanding that at the same time, there were other schools working where not only women were allowed to be in the school, but they were actually administering the school, like the People's Art School of Bitevs in a small Jewish town uh, of what is now known as Belarus, with students as young as 12, 
13, 14 years old, designing architecture together with some of the people that we consider important today, like Elisiski of Kasimir Mialevich, right? Uh, the fact that Vera Molayeva was running the school in 1919, and we're still learning about Gropius in a way, uh, erasing that history, right? Particularly in a country like US that, that makes a really big effort in erase anything that has to do with, uh, with communism or socialism or anarchism or Russia for that matter. Right? understanding what is the legacy of these collectives today, right? The fact that these people as early as 1920 could, have, could work together without having to sign their name in their work, right? Really finding true bonds of solidarity and collaboration in which it's not really about a single author, but about a great narrative that should push them forward into the world. Understanding what other moves, movements were happening at the same time, and we don't even get to hear about them. In the colony of Puerto Rico, as, a, as, a, as I mentioned already, uh, in the practice of rolling tobaccos, right, a really alienating practice in which tobacco workers are rolling tobaccos for many hours in a day, uh, they didn't have any right to a formal education, they would choose one of their own who knew how to read, to read aloud for them during their entire workday. At the beginning, they would read classics like Victor Hugo, but le later on, they would read Karl Marx, Kropotkin, Bakunin, and, uh, and the anti-capitalist, solidary, uh, syndicalist imagination will give fruit to many strikes and many movements asking for a dignified life. Uh, among these people, Luisa Capetillo, Juana Colón, Luisa Capetillo that was arrested several times for wearing pants in public, uh, she was one of the, the leaders of these revolutions, right? Not only was she a loud reader, she also used to run a restaurant in New York where she would serve vegetarian food to workers even if they didn't have any money, right? Understanding what forms of philosophy other, you know, that the La uh, Sylvia Lavins of life or Graham Harman's of life, we can actually learn something valuable for the 21st century, right? Understanding people like Franz Fanon or Angela Davis or Achille Bembe, Sayak Valencia, Silvia Rivera Cosicanqui, all these really important, critical and urgent discourses that oftentimes don't even make it to architecture school, right? Uh, in, in, in this spirit, we published recently a manual of anti-racist architectural education, wondering perhaps about that legacy of the visionary inventor of a so-and-so pedagogical model and trying to understand what is also the role of ideology in education, right? Uh, and, and this is a great diagram by Stefan Truby based on a, a Slavo Zizek cruciform model in which he collocates their, the universal left, the global, the right-wing uh, right, uh, the right-wing uh, capitalist right, uh, right, the anti-Semitic left and the anti-Semitic right. And we know some of these people already, like obviously Patrick Schumacher is a right-winger. So that's like no question. I mean, he makes lectures call in defense of capitalism, like capitalism needs him to defend it, right? Which is kind of silly. Uh, but also understanding where else is this sort of practice of misogyny, sexism, racism is, right? Uh, we know you know, your, your famous masters here, Peter Eisenman and Richard Meyer, and now, you know, the fallen angels from the sky with the Me Too scandal, but also understanding how these things get recycled, right? I remember, you know, here any architecture in New York celebrating Philip Johnson, you know, Nazi, uh, as we all know, without questioning none of that. Uh, they used to travel all around the world, bringing all these sort of uh, professors or architects associated with the Ivy League to tell everybody, you know, about architecture, right? But even if this is sort of an outdated model, how it gets recycled in a way with the same discourses from the same institutions today with magazines with slightly different names, right? Understanding how, you know, uh, in the panel on one side, as you can see, most of the men that are gonna explain us about architecture. Uh, and, and oftentimes when we have an alternative, like in the case of Justin Garrett Moore, when he was presenting and got erased by Architect Magazine out of a panel, right? Somebody went to the trouble of erasing the only black speaker in the panel out of the image, right? So we really have a problem with our institutions. And it's not new, and we need to do something about it. So in a way, we created this manual to not only think about the obvious ridiculous statements like you know Donald Trump signing an executive order to promote civic architecture. Maybe he had a contract with Duke University, uh, um, but um, but working 
with, uh, with other institutions uh, that sometimes even well-intended or, or coming from a, from a, a place of uh, liberal uh, 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 good intentions uh, are super complicit in the erasure, erasure and, and, and violence against, uh, against black people, right? In the case that uh, somebody can, can uh, basically hire young black children to play with toy guns in a plaza for the applause of other white people in a space where they pretty much will get shot by the police. It is not because it's a biennale uh, and, it, and it's not because it's sent there by a, by a white person, right? Or, or, or all these people designing all these monuments for, for, uh, for black slaves where the word black is never to be found and where apparently they couldn't find any black designer, right? Because uh, uh, blackness is only there to be a monument of slavery, but never to be a designer of, of things, right? Uh, understanding what are the publications also that are doing this, right? And this is a very popular publication by our colleague uh, in Virginia Tech, uh, where he says that non-referential architecture has nothing to do with utopia, dystopia, or wokeism, or critical theory, but rather about that single genius shaping the world through architecture, right? And understanding how dangerous is to keep thinking like that in the 21st century, right? Understanding that right-wing spaces are not only gas chambers and detention centers in the border, but architecture school has been that for a long time, right? Not only in these pictures, as you can see, of Harvard when uh, Walter Gropius was there, right? As you can see, a bunch of boys deciding how are we all gonna live, but even in the legacy of institutions like SciArc, right? With the, uh, the, the sort of a very macho vibe of L experimental LA, you know, trying to break away from the institutions, how radical can the institutions truly be, right? What, what is the legacy of these systems of knowledge? In this case, when we have like the wheel of the Bauhaus that if we translate it is quite easily understood as a separation between things that men could do and women could do, right? And for this, we propose a spiral that where everything should be intersected, right? Where anti-racism is at the center, but it has anti-ableism, transfeminism, anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, ecological justice, and where every form of knowledge should get intersected through that if we really want to have a critical discussion about anything, right? So if you want to talk about your triple O or your post-digital or your parametric, and you're not really intersectioning it into ecological justice or ecological uh, or anti-colonialism or transfeminism, what are we doing really? Are we really thinking about the future or are we dwelling in past discourses, right? Understanding how these tools that we have been seeing for a long time, like the evolutionary tree by Charles Jenks that gets recycled all the time, but never really integrating a real critical discourse can be understood in these regimes of anti-blackness all around the world, as we can see between Jim Crow apartheid and white Australia policy. Understanding this in these graphics, the relationship between Philip Johnson attending a, not a Hitler June's rally the same year he founds the architecture and design department of MoMA, right? So it's not just a coincidence that these institutions have been historically anti black, right? Uh, and it is not a coincidence also that many institutions you will never see. Uh, people from other social and economic classes, right? Uh, and, and we show us, as we show in these diagrams, and these are a problem really of, of uh, higher education in general, right? But if we see the, the, the tuition, uh, the endowments and the tuitions of many institutions, especially architecture schools, uh, versus the people that live in the communities where the university is located, it's almost impossible for them to even aspire to study there. So who truly can be an architect today? who truly can learn about the discipline that is gonna save us, right, through architecture? What is, who, who truly can be a utopian or a revolutionary or a rebel within a discipline that is by system and by, by all the ways it operates completely exclusionary? Decolonizing the university starts with the deprivatization and rehabilitation of a public space. The rearrangement of spatial relationship Fanon spoke so eloquently about in the first chapter of Les Danes de la Terre, it starts with a redefinition of what is public, what pertains to the realm of a common, and as such does not belong to anyone in particular, 
because it must be equally shared between equals. Post-colonial landscapes. So inspired by the project of Vinovis that was uh, defining a new way of wearing collectively, we founded Post Novis, which was uh, also uh, the idea of producing uh, as a group and uh, having also a lot of different members from different fields. So expanding also the, the, the idea of collaborating with uh, people who are in the field of, of cinema, literature, and arts. And then we set ourselves like a, a series of events that we call it like planetary events that could take many different forms uh, and inhabit many different landscapes. In this case, based on the criticism of this sort of invitation of Alexander von Humboldt to some sort of Western discovery of the world, right? Like going to all these landscapes and all these uh, forms of representation we set ourselves to sort of transform all these uh, uh, projects of, of, of representation of a sort of what we call post-colonial landscapes, right? And understand that legacy of, uh, of uh, manifest destiny through representation and part uh, a series of projects that we develop initially as the, the imagining of how architecture has been used as a military tool for the occupation of spaces in the tropics uh, and, and through a series of exhibitions colonial room where we show all these drawings and paintings and and uh, and images evolve in a series of um, of what we call post-colonial postcards that are, that are trying to address that sort of and question the legacy of these images as the politicized you know and, and quote unquote in this case uh, we're trying to really question the the history of reading these images as the politicized images and trying to insert again at the center the role that the imaginary of, of uh, occupation takes in them, right? So uh, we take all these images and sort of reimagine them through, through the insertion of these militarized architectures. We're also working currently on a play that works uh, on the idea of post novice Hopefully by the end of this semester, we'll be creating a digital play with many different uh, members of the collective all around the world, uh, addressing these ideas of the loud readers, of the, of the, of the sort of, uh, the, what the, what the post novice collective is asking in versus all these images that have been created in the history of representation. Uh, and also recently we did a collaboration with, uh, with United Nude, uh, the fashion brand in which not only the narratives were about these landscapes as desolated, but we, where we have the opportunity to insert ourselves through this sort of shooting during COVID that became a collaboration where we could insert ourselves in the landscapes why are we telling these stories, right? So the idea of the designer as a behind the scenes orchestrator was sort of uh, challenged by the idea that we are actually there narrating the stories about the landscapes. This also relates to a project we're working right now in, the, in Venice that opened uh, for the Biennale called the, the Unfolding Pavilion, where 12 architects did, a, did a, um, a residency in a small island in a building by John Hayduke that was demolished. Uh, and where we also can explore the idea of what does it mean to have a post-colonial room in which we are thinking about these uh, models of representation, right? Of what does it mean to be post-colonial? Uh, in the last iteration of the MoMA PS1 pavilion, we proposed also a, a rethinking of the idea of the, of the migrant body, of the refugee body in New York, particularly with tropic, the tropical history of immigration to New York, and we propose also uh, a post-colonial summer garden there uh, that also translated in a series of other uh, exhibitions and performances. So for example, that's like a, an installation we did with a post uh, novice collective where we reappropriated the, some of the idea of architecture and uh, organized also a series of events around the installation and exhibition where all the students and professors from literature and, and uh, writers of fiction were all collaborating in creating these narratives that allow us to reflect on the history of this sort of idea of collaboration, but also while reading all this uh, um, post-colonial or uh, trans-feminist or anti-capitalist discourses and trying to think you know, about the relationship with architecture through a series of publica pu publications, exhibitions, uh, manifesto readings. This one was in, uh, the first one was in Omaha, in Nebraska, um, followed by a series of talks. Uh, we, the, the last physical 
lecture we did was in Carnegie Mellon and we turned it into a propaganda event where we were trying to recruit people for Postnobis, uh, as you can see in this image. And even more recently, we also had the opportunity to create after COVID a free online architecture school or trade school of architecture. And you can access it still today where we have talks by many different people, many different thinkers, practitioners all around the world in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas and in Europe in, in which uh, all these critical discourses can come to the forefront and everything is available there with the workshops and the, and the readings and the textbooks and so on trying to rethink that legacy of the loud reader in the tobacco factory as, a, as something that we can bring today. It allows us also to create like the anti-racist manifesto and share it through that platform um, and also create other platforms in different languages and many different ways of loud reading, right? Like that practice of the tobacco factory brought into contemporary times here with the Afro talks in Puerto Rico, or even having the opportunity to loud read in the streets of Pittsburgh during the Black Lives Matter protests, right? And even joining, uh, I think like real revolutionaries or activists that are working in the streets in their, in their programs against white supremacy. Following also the idea of loud, loud reading, that's a, a studio we had the opportunity to run in Carnegie Mellon, where we ask our students to become contemporary loud readers and to imagine a campus and laboratories that would go around different topics that they thought uh, was urgent. And so for, that's like, a, for example, like a, the campus design uh, that they did with a model. And what was interesting is that we did that before last summer, but already a lot of topics that become really vivid during this summer was, were already tackled. So for example, Taylor Latime did like this labo laboratory for emancipation of blackness, where she was showing like a lot of contemporary artists and the idea of holding discussion uh, about uh, contemporary events. Oh, Christopher Elric, who did like this labo laboratory for writing, so like a school for writing. Or oh, Crystal Shu, who was questioning also the role of social media and all the different kind of um, surveillance. Cassandra Howard who was also uh, tackling the, the issue of land reclamation and how food also can be centered uh, in architecture and our culture and what, I, what is our relationship with the land, or Sijen who questioned the, the role of the American dream. And we also had the opportunity to do a lot of different events with a lot of different publics. Uh, so that's, for example, like a series of workshops that we did with children uh, when we were in Beijing or in different schools. Uh, and we also created a, like a series of books for children where we uh, play with the idea of narrative as critical narrative to to understand what does it mean to to build the world together or to live uh, co commonly, right? That's in like another installation that we did also with children, where we had the opportunity to work with them uh, in the idea of constructing not just cities uh, but also like system and engage, engaging again uh, about the discussion of making. Uh, the world together, other worlds together. So I like a lot of uh, pictures of an installation where we could also uh, welcome a lot of kids of different ages. Part three, form and media, 2008. The limits of my language means the limit of my world. And these are the two last parts we want to show. The first one is about uh, now that we're in the discussion of like, oh no, you know, like formalism, that's a Eurocentric uh, uh, strategy. We have to kill formalism. There's other forms of doing. Uh, I, I love this picture of the of the cat in the, in the, that they found in um, in Nazca in Peru, right? To show that um, we have always been, always been formalist. That's not really something that Europeans invented, and that's something that is really at the center of our of our practice. Uh, you know, between humor uh, and, and, and seriousness, trying to understand what is the role and the legacy and where, is, where we can find that solidarity with history, right? Across cultures, but in, in these discourses of, of, um, of solidarity and struggle and, 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 and of questioning of the status quo, right? Uh, for us, we see it across many different media. And, and we are also a practice that because of the situation, the, the political situation, economic situation, has to figure out how to use that legacy to generate 
some sort of platforms of exchange of knowledge, right? Uh, publications have been really central to our practice in the same way as exhibitions. This is the first uh, uh, self-commissioned exhibition we did back in 2011 in Beijing and many later exhibitions like the first one, uh, the first Chicago Architecture Biennale where we have an installation or our most recent book on narrative architecture, right? So all these questions take many different platforms across different media that is really central to that continuous questioning of uh, who controls history, who controls the historical narrative, right? And how can we challenge that history, right? How can we retell the history of utopias, like in this series of collages, about a hundred years of utopias. And a most recent mural we did for an exhibition in Nuremberg, about 120 ideal cities. Um, we didn't get to go because of COVID, but luckily, at least they managed to do the exhibition. So it's 120 years of ideal cities for the good and for the bad. On the, trying to understand, as, as Tom said in the introduction, uh, we always trying to understand really the, what's the legacy and the power of form because the powerful seems to be able to understand it, but then somehow that practice is kept away from us, right? From the people in a way, trying to understand how, how can we use that? What is the relationship of form and, and ideology and political ideology? What is the relationship of form and narrative? Uh, we made this publication that we published in 2013 uh, that now is being translated to Chinese and published hopefully this year, if, uh, if COVID allows, and presented it to a series of also exhibitions, in this case in Beijing. It got translated into German by Arsch Plus in 2016, presented also in other forms of exhibitions in Germany, and uh, later on turned even into projects for pavilions in China, like the Pavilion of Shapes, and a series of publications that dealt purely with the idea of form as a universal language, where we will explore through this publication that was published in 2014, and a series of poems, of shape poems, that will uh, challenge uh, scale uh, and, and, and media also, right? So trying to strip that idea of language to the bare minimum, right? Through installation and through many other different strategies as uh, you can see, these are all of our pictures of our old apartment in Beijing when we used to run sort of uh, performance installations and a series of, uh, of events in larger institutions. Part four, platform, spaces for pedagogy. Since each of us was several, we were already quite a crowd. And this is the last part of the exhibition. And we're gonna show you some architectural projects or some architectural platforms uh, we were one of the finalists to design the, the largest museum in Russia. <laughs> uh, somehow that was the, our first big project that we actually got paid for, what we, for our work. And we ended up traveling to, to Moscow to design this new center of contemporary art. We wanted to do a space that was open to the people, even if it, they didn't have money to pay. So we proposed to put all the galleries in the second level and open all the public spaces in the ground level so people can actually have an art program without having to pay this ridiculously expensive tickets that museums have today. Uh, at the end, the client wanted a tower, so they chose a project by another architect, and we were kind of crushed. But when we returned to Beijing, we figured out that we can have a program that has a different budget, right? So we found a small space in the center of the city, and we opened Intelligentsia Gallery, and it became a really a, a, one of the, I would say, a leading center of critical discourse in China for a span of three years where we would do uh, perhaps one of the few spaces that will run a truly international program with Chinese artists, but also artists from all, every single continent, except Antarctica. As I remember, we, we managed to do exhibitions, group shows always with, uh, in this case, uh, Yuan Shi, that is a leading uh, young uh, um, Chinese filmmaker or many different uh, exhibitions that dealt with many different discourses and positions. This was the second year anniversary exhibition. A great event is in the making, but no one has noticed. And again, you can see the, the sort of the crowd in this salon hanging with uh, issues engaging with architecture or representation, materialism, uh, um, queer theory. There was a uh, many different opportunity to explore many different ideas, uh, as you can see, uh, with architects, designers, writers, poets, um, all together working uh, in this sort of anti-profit space 
uh, for, for position and discourses. This allows us to engage with larger institutions, with museums and art centers later on, where we will create all these exhibitions, as the, this one's hypertext or 010. You really, uh, know, uh, you really know where you are for the first time in history. It's the last exhibition we did when we were in, uh, in Beijing. Um, with, uh, here you can see Fala Atelier or Christopher Rey Perez, Yuan Shi, um, Lena Sibisova from Moscow. Um, and then after this, we were getting invited to do projects. Uh, and these are two projects we, I want to show you about the integrate education and, and, uh, and sort of art as a public platform. Uh, in the first one, uh, we were invited by a developer to, to rethink a courtyard house that was in a kind of dilapidated state. And uh, they wanted us to do a second gallery, a second intelligentsia gallery there. And uh, we proposed that it was only possible to do this if we fixed the conditions of our neighbors because they didn't have toilets. They had to go to a public toilet and it's really uncomfortable and it's cold in the winter. So we proposed to use, uh, to increase the budget potentially and have the gallery with a residency, but also to fit, to, to create uh, more dignifying spaces for living. We'd run an exhibition as an example to the, for the developer. Uh, and then we, we, we made a proposal uh, and we proposed how to improve the spaces, provide toilets and kitchens for the neighbors. At the end, the developer didn't want to invest in the neighbor, so we declined the project. But I think it was a, that was the only way we could have done this project. And then the last project we wanted to show to you is a school we did in collaboration with the, with the director of the business, uh, international business uh, department in, uh, in the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So the idea was to create like a, a campus that would, two campuses, uh, one that would be located in, in Nebraska and the other one that would be in Africa and to allow exchanges uh, between students between the both continent. Um, so we approached the, the project with the idea of working uh, with a modular system to be able also to adapt in, in the different contexts that the project uh, would, would be in. And what really interested us uh, with the program is that it was also about re-questioning education and agriculture and art would be at the center of a school. So we approach the architecture thinking always like the relationship with, with the land uh, and the ground. So each building can have access, easy access to the outdoor. So there's like many courtyards uh, where a lot of different uh, um, plants can grow. And the idea also of, of having a campus that would adapt through time. Um, so that's like, for example, like also like the main art spaces that could be also very flexible uh, to hold classes, but also exhibition. Uh, and again, always this relationship with the outdoor spaces. So the, all the students, the idea that of the, pedag the pedagogical model of this school is that students learn through art making and farming, right? So there's this relationship between art and, and engaging with the land that provides uh, and that you have to take care of. Um, so the, the whole idea was that the school can grow and shrink and it doesn't matter where it is, but in this case, always has direct access to an atelier and to, and to the gardens in the, in the building. And that it can potentially be used all year long. Thank you. Thank you.